Speaking of dogs, uh, it's time for the uh, weekly installment of Ezekiel Kralin's story about the two little dogs and the uh, um, drug addict who comes around and takes advantage of him. And he he's paid, apparently, by being allowed to be near the dogs that he loves so much. So that's all you have to know about this. He also gives the guy money, just huge chunks of money, and charges up all of his phones and shit that he brings by and absorbs all manner of uh, of abuse. And I just I don't understand why he does it, but he keeps doing it and telling the story of it. And here is that story for this week. We're up to Christmas and uh, in the story. And the story is titled The Soggy Spirit of Xmas. I hope, did I read this last week? No, I did not. Okay. There's a lot of uh, similarity in the tone and manner. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Ezekiel Kralin wrote, Email post from December 27th to the 29th. Subject, the morning went well, but then Deke Monster showed up. Shortly after noontime, Deke hollered up to my window. I waved at him to let him know I'll be right out. <coughs> I soon exited the building, wished him a good morning, and crouched down to greet the wee hounds. He asked me to bring them a meal and water, then pick up the large speaker to charge it, the one he purchased two days ago with my $100 final allowance for the month. So when I returned downstairs and set down the doggies' bowls, their master told me the speaker's connection, speaker connection's already a bit wobbly. So be real careful when I plug it in, or it'll be your fault if it doesn't work because it was working fine before I gave it to you. He spoke those words in harsh staccato and literally was foaming at the mouth, the side effect of smoking crystal when you don't stay hydrated. Uh-oh, I thought. The port's already broken, and he's trying to set me up. Only one way to deal with it. In that case, Deke, I'd rather you plug it in. So let me bring a USB cord right down, I replied. And with that, Watson, he exploded in a fury, screaming at the top of his lungs. So, yeah, now he's back to screaming. Just take it inside and plug it in, carefully. Nope, I'm getting the cord, I repeated and rushed upstairs against his demand. Now there was a flurry of words between us for several minutes before I said that and turned back toward the gate, him hollering and myself replying sotto voce with immense patience. A few people walked by a bit cautiously until they saw I was in control. In the midst of this one-way squabble, I noticed Lucky wasn't wearing his sweater, though Flacco had hers, and asked if he still has it because it's cold outside. I don't want to hear your fake shit. He screeched. You don't love these dogs. You're a phony. Whatever, Deke, I answered back. I washed their spare jackets. They're dry and clean now, so I can put one on Lucky. Well, he'd have none of it, and demanded once more I bring the speaker upstairs, picked it up and shoved it in my direction, but I stepped back, said he doesn't need to plug it in because the cord needs to be plugged in to the outlet first, so what's the point? He knew very well what the point was, but I went ahead anyway, told him that's not true. Then, seeing the pups had finished their meal, I picked up the empty bowls, said, I'll be right back, and returned to Hovel to retrieve the USB cord, with Deke screaming bloody murder because I didn't take the speaker with me. When I returned and held the cord up, telling him to please plug it in himself, he went ballistic again. At that point, I handed his smartphone back that he just gave me and made it clear to him there's no way I'll do him any favors when he acts cuckoo, with a twirl of my index finger around my ear for emphasis. So just when I made a move to step back inside, he marched off in a rabid huff. I stood there and watched them diminish up the block and called out, Don't come back till you calm down, please. You are foaming at the mouth. He screamed back, Shut up! Shut the fuck up! But I'm not sure, though, whatever he said had to be nasty one way or another, because that's the mood he was in. Foolish me, once I returned to the comfort of my dump, and the Internet, I thought I was going to have a peaceful afternoon. But no, nope, Deke returned barely ten minutes later, this time with a large drink in his hand and no more spittle-drenched lips, thank glob. They were situated this time at the corner of the bus stop. 
As soon as I stepped out and presented the cord to him and said, just plug it in, please, then I'll take it upstairs, he once more started wailing like a banshee with bronchitis. Two fellows were standing about 15 feet away in front of the super-duper burger joint, laughing it up among themselves, though they did take a couple of glances at us due to Deke's boisterous harangues. See? Deke blasted. You made me act like an idiot in front of them. Nope, I replied. You're doing that all by yourself. Act like an idiot and you'll be called an idiot. It's just common sense. A quality you seem to have in short supply. Now please plug in the cord for me. He knocked it from my hand right then. So I picked it up and said, Well, then I'm going back inside without your speaker. I petted the dogs first before departing while Deke continued to fume a smokestack of vitriol while turning his cart in the direction of Noe Street, ready to take off. Once upstairs again, I figured now I'll have a peaceful afternoon, but no. Once more, Deke returned barely ten minutes later, so I came back downstairs with cord in hand, and as I approached within several feet of him, he began screaming again and tossed the now empty soda cup at my torso with a light, uh, a light whack. My torso with a light whack. Flacco shivered in fear while Lucky just stood watching us a tad cautiously. Oh, you're hurting the dogs, Deke, I said and crouched down to reassure them with kind caresses. But he persisted furiously with a barrage of absurd insults and horrible accusations, which I ignored and continued to comfort Lucky and Flacco. I'm not going to take your speaker upstairs without first testing the port, I told him. So if you're not going to do it, I will right now. The plug fit fine. But then Deke went hysterical, demanded I remove the cord before picking up the speaker. I refused and told him that's nonsense, but when I started to lift it, he removed the cord and handed it to me. I noticed that he had set the missing sweater down on the sleeping bag before I stepped out, along with the one Flacco was wearing. Oh, okay, I said, picked up the elfin garments. I'll bring down the clean jackets in a minute. Of course, part of his rants included how he loves the dogs, but he can't go to any parties with them or get anything else done on his rounds, blah, blah, blah. He's ready to get rid of them. Then he ragged on about how I fucked up dog sitting in my hovel, that I'm shit for not caring for them outdoors for most of the day, maybe even overnight. I simply replied, looks to me like they're keeping you out of trouble. And as I've said before, more than once, now I'll say it again, I love these dogs, sorry, love these dogs with all your heart, and your world will get better day by day. That didn't go over well, needless to say. At any rate, things calmed down and he camped out by the bus stop into the late evening, even though he said he's about to leave. Once I took the speaker into my hands, he soon crashed out beneath the sleeping bag with the hounds tucked away inside. As this snapshot shows, you can see his hand sticking out by the water bowl and his Santa's elf cap atop the shopping cart. Of course, you can't see the poochies without X-ray vision, but they're there snoozing away in doggy dreamland. I gave that picture a title, post Xmas Exhaustion. Sometime after nightfall, Sean appeared by Deke and Pups. He's that large, friendly black dude I've mentioned several times before. I said hi to him when I stepped out to return a fully charged speaker and smartphone. It had just started to rain a light drizzle, so I had placed the speaker in a large trash bag and handed Deke four more bags to protect the contents of his cart, himself, and the dogs. But he had already set up an overhead waterproof tarp of generous size, draped over the cart on one side and a large umbrella on the other. Surprisingly spacious, and Flacco and Lucky were secure and dry within. I also handed him a second sleeping bag, seeing as his cart no longer contained a mountain of clothing like it did two days ago. Another hour or so had passed before he called up to me again. Zeke, can you give me that tent now? I looked down at him, frowned, and shook my head side to side, and said, no, of course not. He didn't give me grief over that, but just returned to the corner where he was camped, we had this discussion earlier when he mentioned my pop-up Teton I used for a while to sit the dogs behind my building. You said you'd give me that tent. Could I have it now? No, I never said that, Dick, I replied. It's tricky to set up anyway. I'd have to show you step by step, otherwise you wouldn't know what to do. Probably break one of the rods and dump it on the streets in a day or two. Besides which, Watson, every time he's had a tent that he could set up, he trashed it somewhere on the streets after just one or two nights. So giving him my tent is the same as tossing it into a dumpster. 
Besides which, no one in the Castro wants to ever see a tent again, especially a large one like mine. Neighbors would complain to the SFPD, and they'd tell him to knock it down and move on. About three months ago, Deke told me he had a nice tent, but a cop showed up, told him it's too big, he's got to get rid of it, take it somewhere else. He can easily construct a makeshift tent from materials he picks up or purchases on the cheap from that Goodwill bargain bin garage, like he did this evening. After an hour playing his speaker, he decided to hand it back to me till he's ready to leave. He was waiting at the front gate, and once I arrived, instructed me to charge it a little more, and when he wants it back, double bag and tie it up. The doggies were right there beside him, close to the gate, just dying with joyful expectation to step inside. Sad that their master would tease them like that, though I guess he thinks he's teasing me instead. They weren't on their leashes, so when Deke walked toward the bus stop, Flacco followed. But her brother stubbornly stood by the gate and then sat down beside Scampy, who surprisingly was sitting right next to the gate, having a smoke. I didn't see her there until I heard her crackly voice. Hello, Lucky, she said, and began to pet him. Just two nights ago, when again the pups were off-leash and Deke was camped out by the lamppost close by, the pups followed me to the front gate. I had to gently block them from entering before Deke called to them. Upon closing the gate and reaching the stairs, I looked back and saw them both standing there, peering into the lobby through the bottom of the glass pane, like little elves, and gazing at me with those sparkly eyes and high hopes filled with joy and amity I wanted so badly right then and there to run back, sweep them into my arms, and bring them home. But I couldn't. Fuck the holidays. Deke does a great job of ruining them, as do certain people who occupy Hotel California North, not the least of whom is the doddering old building manager. Well, at least I no longer have to contend with my quasi-fascist neighbor down the hallway, and that's a blessing. Or that nasty old gossipy coot who died a year and a half earlier, with whom I had to share the restroom for seven grievous years, and lay eyes on his sour face almost every day. Shudder. Subject, the soggy spirit of Xmas. After Deke and Pups had departed last night, about an hour later I stepped out to purchase two packets of chocolate M&Ms at Rosenberg's. On my way back I noticed a sopping wet item draped over the back of the bus stop seats. First I thought it was one of those puffy large jackets, but once I got closer I realized it was the sleeping bag I gave Deke last week. See picture. I got pissed over that because I just gave him a second sleeping bag for good measure, not so he could throw the other one away. So I picked it up and brought it home to hang dry, after first laying down two trash bags on the floor, with a thick cover of newspapers over that. Good old Bay Area Reporter, the most widely circulated LGBT paper on the planet, saved the day once again. But it's now morning. The sleeping bag is almost completely dry and clean since the rain gave it a thorough wash, and I thought about why he discarded it. His canopy, though waterproof, wasn't enough to keep the water from running beneath the sleeping bag, uh, which he set down on the sidewalk, had he placed a couple of trash bags beneath it, which I gave him. That may not have occurred, though maybe the circumference of the canopy was not sufficiently broad to keep the rain from invading his humble shelter. So the bag got wet, the dogs couldn't remain there, and Deke stepped out to ask for that tent. Not that I'm saying the tent would have helped one iota due to the obstacles I previously stated, although I understand perfectly why he made that request. But of course, should he bring it up and berate me for providing for not providing him with a tent, he'd oppose my rationale for lack of comprehension and or simply to guilt trip me. A two for one bonus. Not a ray of sunshine all day yesterday, and it looks to be more of the same today. I actually love this kind of weather, though my concern for the beloved hounds puts a damper on that, pun intended. Two days ago, their master conjured up another ridiculous excuse not to accept any offer for a roof over his head that a homeless service could provide, and it's a doozy. Quote, They'll probably give me a room where somebody just died. I'll be sleeping in that same bed. I told him that's ridiculous. It's against the law. And anyway, over half the housing in this country was built by people long dead. Furthermore, someone could have died in my room before I rented it. And what about hotel and motel rooms the tourists stay in? People die in those places, too. That's just life. Piece of advice, Watson. Never befriend a houseless person during the holiday season. Or if you already have such a friend, make arrangements to avoid them during Yuletide, if at all possible. Subject. A busy night. 13 seconds video. Date, December 29th. 
This was last night. Shows Scampy cleaning off a large plastic tarp, which I think she is offering to Deacon Doggies as a rain shelter. About five minutes later, she was done and neatly folded it up, as this picture shows. It's quite dark right below my window, so you can't really make out Deacon, visitor, whoever that was, and the pups snuggled up beneath the comforter. I was glad to see they're still in their jackets, though a bit damp earlier. Keeping them on anyway still preserves warmth, so their master did the right thing. They weren't shivering in the least and in good spirits to boot. I was also pleased that Deke had set down a large sheet of cardboard so the pups wouldn't have to sit directly on the concrete. That's a first, Watson. He did it without any intervention on my part. The second sleeping bag was on the damp side, so I lifted it from the cart and took it upstairs to dry out. Then I brought down the first one, now completely dry, after hanging it from my clothesline overnight. As soon as I tossed it down, Flacco leapt onto it, began pushing it around and fluffing it up, then flipped over on her back to start squirming in unbridled glee. This caused her and the sleeping bag to start sliding off the cardboard toward the curb, so I gingerly slid her back toward the wall and moved the bowl of water to the left because she almost knocked it over in her enthusiasm, which would have soaked the newly dried comforter. Looks like she's mastering, sorry, mastered. Looks like she's mastered the art of happy squirming and now gives Lucky a run for the money as she no longer waits for her brother to kick off the wiggle fest. Deke wasn't any problem in our latest meetup. In fact, while Flanco was curled up in her master's lap for almost two hours, he constantly stroked her ears, neck, and back and patted her little rump with Lucky curled up nearby in cushy comfort. Cyrus showed up, the brawny fellow from Michigan who I met years ago and is now back in town. We had a nice talk, though nothing worth reporting. A couple of other vagrants stopped by to hang with Deke for a cordial nighttime soiree. Then there's this person who appeared out of nowhere, who I don't even think knew Deke or anyone else attending. He just sat by himself alongside the curb in silent reverie amid a glorious little setup of his own creation. He wore a Santa cap and sat cross-legged with head bowed upon a fine square of fabric that glinted a splendor of aureate sparks. A white blanket scattered with red and green stars was wrapped over his shoulders and around his upper arms and torso, and a pair of loose baggy pants dyed in a medley of bold blocks of color, mostly dark green and red, graced his lower half. You can tell by the hands curled above his lap he's most likely African-American. Be that as it may, no matter the skin color, it was like a scene from the nativity where one wise man among three thought honoring two darling little quasi-doxins far more worthy of his devotion. Sage decision, indeed. 